Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, dear ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd like you, uh, to take you through a course um, about uh, uh, systemic uh, manifestations of um, pulmonary disease. And I've broken up the whole um, bunch of different diseases and entities into uh, sudden, uh, certain pathomorphological groups. One is fibrosis, second is eosinophilia-like or imitating lung disease, um, evidence of that it could be storage disease, hyperplasia or neoplasia within the lung, hemorrhage, aneurysm or other vascular, gross vascular abnormality, embolism, shunting and pulmonary hypertension. So let's start with fibrosis, as we are having now a new classification of the um, idiopathic interstitial um, fibrosis or um, pneumonias. Um, let's look at the clinical pathological diagnosis. Um, we have um, frequent and less frequent diseases, and how do these fit into systemic disease? Um, actually, all these could um, uh, occur in systemic disease, namely in um, collagen vascular diseases. So um, looking at pulmonary involvement of collagen vascular disease, we look at different entities um, or morphological patterns that we should know about from the um, ARS uh, classification. So this, for example, is a UIP with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, this CVD is pulmonary involvement, and we look at whether we can see any signs of systemic uh, disease or other um, uh, involvement, um, such as the uh, dilated esophagus in a patient with NSIP and scleroderma. Or we look at um, pulmonary involvement in this patient, um, uh, NSIP with uh, lupus erythematosus. Um, this patient um, has uh, pulmonary involvement in a CVD. Um, however, this is rather nonspecific because um, it is um, organizing uh, pneumonia um, in polymyositis or dermatomyositis. So um, looking at these entities, uh, we can um, uh, see and guess that uh, there is a broad overlap between this uh, single entities of scleroderma, for example, with lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and uh, coming to terms with these things, we always ask, when we see a UIP pattern, is this typical for idiopathic fibrosis, or is this atypical, an atypical pattern? For example, this is rather a typical pattern with the lower zone predominance of the um, honeycombing distribution. And um, uh, so is it, um, uh, in terms of radiology, a clear UIP pattern, a possible UIP pattern, or inconsistent with UIP pattern? And then we make up uh, the diagnosis potentially with help of um, the um, lung biopsy pattern and come up with um, some atypical pulmonary involvement or atypical pattern of UIP in this patient with rheumatoid arthritis. Are there suggestive additional CT findings, such as uh, in this patient with um, dilatation of the esophagus in scleroderma, in a crest syndrome? Um, is there clinical evidence of systemic disease? Um, so do we know any um, clinical um, uh, details about the patient, such as in this patient with acute renal failure and lupus erythematosus, and so on? Um, so do we have any suggestion of underlying systemic diseases um, within um, the morphology of the um, disease that we, that we see in the lungs, such in this uh, patient uh, with LIP. And LIP is usually associated with um, either EBV or immunosuppression or with collagen vascular disease, such as Sjögren's syndrome. Um, however, we will be left with a handful of patients where we can't say really anything. And we have this chameleon um, um, for example, this patient um, has the same um, uh, pattern in the lung, or actually the same um, uh, morphological uh, appearance on uh, pathology as um, the uh, um, um, subsequent patients. 
uh, organizing pneumonia is, has many morphological phases. We can divide them into typical and less frequently or atypical patterns, and we end up having um, to say well, this is subpleural consolidation or this is a, a rather bronchocentric distribution, and I would not be very happy to, um, on first hand, first sight, call this OP. This is just a differential diagnosis. This is rather um, suggestive because we have an extensive perilobular pattern here. And this is a chronic progressive fibrosing form of OP, which is, again, very difficult to have in the um, uh, upper differential diagnosis. Can we narrow differential from acuity of clinical cause? Well, suddenly, um, certainly, sometimes we can um, if there is fulminant respiratory failure of a previously healthy patient and we have no, no other known cause. Um, and we have an appearance like this uh, in a patient, for example, with uh, rheumatoid arthritis without methotrexate at the time, and we would call this an AIP. Um, so we can uh, actually um, a counterpoint between um, chronic fibrosing and acute um, uh, idiopathic or secondary um, uh, interstitial pneumonias. So let's go to the next subject, eosinophilic-like consolidation. Um, the questions that spring to mind to me um, were, um, are they peripheral, purely based consolidations? Yes or no? Um, do we have bronchovasocentric infiltrations or nodules? Do we have eosinophilia? Is there evidence of infection? And whatever other clinical information is available in these patients? Um, a typical um, a patient is a, uh, is a church Strauss syndrome, which is a systemic necrotizing vasculitis of small arteries and veins and affects adults of all ages. And we have a rhinitis, cough, dyspnea, rash, and peripheral neuropathy. And having the clinical, um, you are fairly confident seeing an image like that, call that rather or probably um, church strauss syndrome. Uh, where you have these vasobronchocentric nodules, they have a halo of um, ground glass opacity, and some of the um, consolidation-like um, confluent nodules have um, um, uh, are attaching the pleura. Um, certainly, uh, much more evidently in this patient, you have this um, typical um, um, eosinophilic-like um, pleural consolidation with broad um, contact to the um, visceral pleura in many places. However, um, this is a very different patient, and um, we didn't have a, a story like that at all in this patient, but he looks like our first patient with CSS. However, he is a patient with Katayama fever and, and a subacute schistosomiasis. So these patients may have a similar appearance in their eosinophilia uh, within the lung. And um, again, um, a similar appearance. We should always look at whether the patient could have um, neoplasia of the lung or secondary neoplasia within the lung um, with um, lymphoma when you have um, these either vasobronchocentric or plurally based um, consolidation areas. <clears throat> the left patient was a pulmonary malt, malt lymphoma and the, and the right patient was a, was a large cell NHL with EIC, so um, extensive intravascular component. Um, is there any evidence of possible storage disease? So do we have predominant or dominant septal thickening? Do we have ground glass opacities? Do we have nodules that are predominantly centrilobular? Um, otherwise, do we have perhaps infiltrative lung disease? And again, certainly the clinical information is very, very important in these patients. Truly, um, honestly, most of these patients will come with a storage disease diagnosis to you, and you will just um, confirm that this patient will probably have lung disease um, in a Morbus Gaucher's or um, um, otherwise. Alveolar proteinosis is not always uh, primary or isolated, but can be associated with systemic diseases such in the, as in these two patients. And um, in these two patients, on the left-hand side, you have this typical crazy paving appearance, but it is not mandatory to have that. On the right-hand side, you have rather a reticulation morphology. And this is a patient who has a predominantly um, many, many intralobular septal thickening you look here, where you look there. And uh, this is a patient with Morbus Gaucher. And also he has um, centrilobular fluffy nodules, ground glass nodules, that are very discrete. Certainly you can't make the, uh, the diagnosis only from this image. But this is usually not necessary. Um, 
this is rather a diagnostic image where you can see that you have infiltrates that are lobular in configuration. The um, interlobular septa appears spared, and you have some calcification within these um, cons um, consular or infiltration areas, and these calcifications are um, diagnostic of metastatic calcification, and if this patient um, has a renal failure, you will know that you are right with the diagnosis. Uh, more difficult is the diagnosis of pulmonary amyloidosis, um, especially when this is a primary am uh, pulmonary amyloidosis not associated with other organ manifestations. Um, in the majority of patients, this is the case, but in the minority of patients, you can have additional organs um, affected. You see here um, many um, coalescent masses and pulmonary nodules that are in part um, calcified. So, um, hyperplasia, neoplasia, um, what in terms of lung nodules can we say? Certainly, I'm not expanding on um, pulmonary metastatic disease because um, this will not be able, uh, this will not be possible here right now. Um, but certainly, we ask about lung nodules, um, nodule size and definition of margin, um, bronchovasocentricity, lung cysts, and um, um, systemic or uh, tumor history in other places. For example, this is um, uh, an example about tuberous sclerosis. Um, you may have pulmonary angiomyolipomas. You may have clear cell micronodules in these patients. You, have, you may have multifocal micronodular uh, pneumocyte hyperplasia and um, atypical adenopatous uh, AAH um, nodules. So you have um, a plethora of nodules that you can find in these patients, perhaps, and this was um, the third of these um, possibilities, so this was a pneumocyte hyperplasia. So you may get hyperplasias um, in patients um, with systemic disease, such as this patient with tuberous sclerosis and evidence of tubera within the ventricles and the angiomyolipomas of both kidneys. Um, a bit more difficult may be um, the uh, very rare diagnosis of nodular lymphoid hyperplasia of the lung, which may be primary but may be associated with other lymphoma in other places. And here's an example um, from Kalukias in Pneumonology in, in 2011, um, and another example of um, a patient who had um, multiple um, such small infiltrates of the lung. Um, these um, nodular infiltrates may um, actually be vasobronchocentric and uh, induce bronchial wall thickening. And um, this is a very different um, entity um, of a patient who has funny cysts, and these cysts are aligned alongside um, septi, so interlobular septi and the main septi and they are deformed a bit longitudinally, and sometimes you see vessels displaced by these cysts that are actually um, veins, and um, small um, lobular veins. And um, this is a patient with bird hoc dubie syndrome. Um, diagnostic, however, is the um, uh, appearance of the skin um, nodules that these patients um, have, and sometimes they have renal masses, but this patient didn't have any renal pathology at all, fortunately, because this is uh, usually very highly malignant uh, renal tumors. Um, now we go through to diffuse pulmonary hemorrhage. Um, is this associated with acute or chronic renal failure? Does the patient have sinus sinusoidal disease, bronchial disease? Do we have any other clinical information? Um, are we happy to exclude rheologic causes of um, pulmonary hemorrhage? And um, do we uh, perform a vasculitis screen? Um, good pasture syndrome, for example, is antigromalar basal membrane syndrome. Um, it has a bimodal age distribution, and proteinuria and hematuria is often absent, unfortunately. So we have to guess. And um, if we guess right, we'll get a 90% of positive diagnosis um, uh, determining anti-GBM. And this is a patient just showing evidence of uh, pulmonary hemorrhage uh, together with the clinical symptoms, certainly. And another one who has bled less, a little less um, uh, acutely, so this is a little older, this bleeding, again, a good pasture syndrome. 
Um, another um, disease, um, this is, which is systemic, um, is this goes into a bit uh, into um, vasculitis now. Um, we have a microscopic polyangitis, or MPA, which is a non-granulomatous ANCA-associated small vessel systemic vasculitis. And um, uh, many patients, but they are still less than 50%, have, suffer pulmonary hemorrhage, which is often dangerous to these patients and um, sign of a poor prognosis. And um, most uh, patients um, have a rapid progressive glomerulonephritis. So we again have um, sometimes in different places or all over the place evidence of um, diffuse pulmonary hemorrhage. Um, in patients with SLE, which is an immune complex vasculitis of the arterioles and capillaries, um, we will certainly have a very specific um, uh, antibody pattern. Uh, but however, these patients may actually initially present with acute lupus pneumonitis or pulmonary hemorrhage. And we always should keep in mind that um, patients who suffer pulmonary hemorrhage in SLE have a very poor prognosis of um, uh, 40 to 50%. And um, otherwise, um, we are all fairly familiar with um, uh, lupus patients from our clinical practice. This is a patient who has um, a mix of um, pneumonitis and acute bleeding in the lung from uh, in SLE pneumonitis. And now we go, we just uh, hit the um, ANCA-associated granulomatous vasculitis. We will certainly hear a lot more in a minute. Um, however, in um, systemic disease, we will have to look at that very briefly. Um, certainly with Wegner's disease, we look at uh, whether the patient has respiratory tract disease plus granulomatous plus um, um, pulmonary disease. And we can see here that the manifestation um, at onset is only less than 50% in the lung and 70% in ENT um, tract. And again, we can see um, a more widely distributed acute pulmonary uh, hemorrhages in both lungs and may have to, if the story is not typical and we are not certain what the patient has, we may have to uh, look further. For example, this patient was a, a bleeding patient with sarcoid which um, represents the vasculitic pole of the disease. Um, now we uh, cross over to macroscopic vascular pathology. So um, systemic diseases with macroscopic vascular pathology of the lung. Uh, do we see pulmonary arterial aneurysms, bronchial artery aneurysms? Um, do we have central or cranial um, deep venous thrombosis? Um, are there arterial stenosis or wall thickening <coughs> suggesting um, vasculitis, systemic arterial pathology, or mosaic perfusion. So this is a patient um, with um, um, several bronchial artery aneurysms. And looking at bronchial artery aneurysms, um, there's always um, certainly idiopathic um, possibility, um, um, very severe pulmonary hypertension as a possibility, um, infection, um, and huge Stovin syndrome, or Betchett syndrome. Betcher syndrome um, is additionally characterized um, in a number of patients um, by pulmonary arterial aneurysms that can thrombose or partially thrombose, that can rupture, and that can also produce pulmonary infarction in the periphery to these um, aneurysms. And um, also characterized by deep venous thrombosis here with um, um, upper tract congestion. Again, a patient with Betchett syndrome and sinus thrombosis. And this is a patient um, with um, uh, Ute Stovin syndrome, which is a form thrust of Betchett syndrome without the um, cutaneous uh, manifestations, where you can see the aneurysm of the right lower lobe artery and a peripheral infarction of the um, segment 8. And you can also see in this case that has been published in 2005 the evolution of these aneurysms that take some months or only weeks to evolve and may respond to high steroid um, doses. 
Again, is there evidence of peripheral systemic arterial pathology, such as in this patient with multiple um, aneurysms within the um, um, uh, renal artery of the left side? The same was the case on the right-hand side and the visceral arteries. And this funny pattern in the lung, which was actually small consolidations or infiltrates at the branching patterns of um, of um, uh, uh, um, pulmonary arteries. These were no bleedings, but this was actually pneumonitis that could be treated with steroids. And um, two weeks after steroid induction, you can see here, um, the pulmonary disease was almost, um, had almost disappeared. Um, is there evidence of pulmonary arterial stenosis? So stenosis may actually enter into a, um, a perfusion pattern of the lung that we call mosaic perfusion or mo mo mosaicism, and we can see um, the Takayasho arteritis, and here we can see um, a gross on a high-grade stenosis of the right pulmonary artery in a patient with giant cell arteritis. Certainly, we have to take care of differential diagnosis such as rubella, williams boyron or other congenital diseases that we will probably know by the time of presentation. Um, now, um, for last, is um, signs of vascular origin or pathology in patients with non-thrombotic PE or extravascular origin PE. Um, I go through here. These are different patterns of um, pulmonary embolism. This is tumor embolism within small arterial branches. You can see that um, these branches are dilated in a patient with um, history of breast cancer. This is septic embolism. You will know all um, the appearance of um, these patients. Um, fat embolism may appear as pure ground glass in a, um, um, a sub uh, or actually... Um, segmental pattern. This is um, embolism of echinococcus granulosus, so hydatid disease, through infection of the vena cava inferior. And this is a patient with schistosomiasis in the chronic form with a very coarse um, um, reticulation and um, fibrosis of both lungs and um, a high-grade um, pulmonary hypertension. Now, pulmonary shunting, um, you may all know that pulmonary AV malformations are associated with Randu Weber Osler disease. Two of them had been treated before. We can see um, that um, these pulmonary AV malformations can rupture and certainly lead to all these devastating um, complications um, that warrant treatment in an early stage of the disease. Um, other pulmonary shunting we should always be aware of can exist as... Um, hepatopulmonary syndrome, so actually small shunts at the surface of both lungs in the lower zones, and um, plexiform arteriopathy in patients with um, pulmonary hypertension, such as in this patient with sarcoid pulmonary hypertension. And um, now we cross over to patients with hy uh, pulmonary hypertension. The questions are, do they have uh, collagen vascular disease? Do they have vasculitis? Is the hypertension post-capillary? Do the patients have liver cirrhosis or are other organ systems um, uh, uh, involved? Do, are they severely immunocompromised? Or do we have rheologic problems? So this is a patient with systemic sclerosis and pulmonary hypertension. There's not much evidence of NSIP. There's only slight evidence of NSIP in this patient. This is a patient with rheumatoid arthritis and um, um, secondary um, pulmonary hypertension. And again, you do not see much evidence of interstitial lung disease. This is remarkable in these patients who may either follow the line down to interstitial lung disease or to pulmonary hypertension. And again, a sarcoid patient with pulmonary hypertension. Um, this is a patient who had hepatopulmonary hypertension, so um, severe liver disease, end-stage liver disease, and um, pulmonary hypertension induced through the liver disease. Um, very rare diseases inducing pulmonary hypertension are uh, primarily in the uh, pulmonary vasculature, um, such as the pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis that can be a systemic disease with involvement of multi-organ systems. In this patient, the heart and the spleen was involved as well. 
and um, PVOD, so this is P, uh, pulmonary venous occlusive disease that um, shows a pattern of centrilobular edema plus um, um, interlobular septal thickening. And um, last patient of the pulmonary hypertension line is um, here for you, sickle cell disease, so a rheologic dis disorder that can induce pulmonary hypertension later in the disease after multiple peripheral pulmonary infarctions. Thank you very much for your attention. And um, at last, I'd like to point out ST2014 for you, which will be held um, from June 12th to 14th in Amsterdam. Thank you. Thank you.